My name is Ray Comenzo. I'm a hematologist from Boston, and I'm joined at Myeloma 2016 by several hematologists who participated in the practical application of genomic session this morning. I'm joined by Peter Sonneveld from Rotterdam and by Leif Bergsegel from the Mayo Clinic uh, in Scottsdale, I think it is. And uh, I'd like to begin simply by asking Peter about the participants in the clinical trials. You described a number of uh, clinical trials. How uh, compliant were the participants with the need to obtain patient specimens for study? You presented data on genomics. You presented data on gene sequencing and protein uh, as well. Were the patients very willing to participate in those aspects of your studies? Yeah, in the Netherlands, we have a long-lasting history of doing clinical trials combined with uh, correlative studies. Uh, so not only in myeloma, also AML, lymphoma. So many patients uh, are informed uh, about that when they uh, are asked to participate in the clinical trial. Overall, approximately 80% of the patients that participate will give consent, and approximately 60% of the samples are of high quality that we can use for analysis. In your opinion, how important is it to obtain these samples for study? Well, I think all of us will realize that it is important. Uh, now we are at the stage that we are still looking for uh, predictive markers, biomarkers for outcome with different treatments, but from there it should be developed into uh, let's say, uh, finding targeted treatments based on uh, pre-trial genomic analysis. And I think this is the next challenge that we face. Peter, in his talks today, described a, a, a gene and protein called Cerebron, which may be extremely important in terms of IMID therapy. Leaf, on the other hand, talked a fair amount about a protein called MYC. Can you tell us a little bit about MYC, Leaf, and why it's important? Yes, certainly. You know, I, I think the genomic analysis of multiple myeloma is our most powerful tool to understand the biology of the tumor. And there are different aspects of that that are important. Some of them are chromosome translocations, and some of them are point mutations of individual genes. And one of those, which is a, about a third of patients, is this gene called MYC, which gets dis dysregulated by different kinds of genomic events and it appears to have a very important effect on the prognosis of people, and I think maybe a target for therapy. Because what I showed is that MYC gets dysregulated by things that we call enhancers, and there are a category of drugs that can perhaps target those enhancers and uh, downregulate MYC. As we move forward with all the medicines we have today to treat patients with myeloma, are there any that are particularly effective at dealing with MYC now? Well, uh, the hypothesis that you will hear in the future in the meeting by Dr. Nazar Bayliss is that IMIDs may target the enhancers that dysregulate MYC. So I think if we now analyze patients for MYC rearrangements and IMID response, particularly lenalidomide, we may see an association that we haven't been able to identify up until now. So Peter, tell us about the upcoming trials in the HOVAN and what correlative studies you're going to do. So <clears throat> right now um, we have uh, entered a study uh, that we do together with the IFM, the French group, um, exploring the use of uh, monoclonal antibody against myeloma. It's called Daratumumab. And I think this is really uh, promising because it's a completely different mode of action. So daratumumab might work in patients that are refractory to common agents like imids and proteasome inhibitors. And this has been shown already and published um, for the use of, of daratumumab as monotherapy as well as combined that will be presented at uh, the ESCO meeting. Very promising data. Uh, we are exploring daratumumab now in the frontline setting, transplant eligible patients, where we combine daratumumab with VTD for induction, consolidation, and for maintenance. And so this trial had just started, uh, like other trials in the frontline setting. So we are looking forward to, uh, to the results of that trial, but we have to wait for two years or so. <laughs> So your trial will use stem cell transplant and also daratumumab, which targets a molecule called CD38, 
which is on the outside of myeloma cells. Are you at all concerned about the use of daratumumab, a monoclonal antibody, in the setting of stem cell mobilization, stem cell engraftment, stem cell transplant? So this is um, maybe too early to definitely say, but there are data that uh, indicate that stem cell uh, apheresis and collection is completely safe even in patients treated with daratumumab. And in our trial so far, we don't see any problem. That's great. Leif, the era of monoclonal antibodies is upon us. We have two of them and possibly uh, others uh, in the pipeline. <clears throat> what is your sense of uh, the impact that monoclonal antibodies will have on the natural history of myeloma? Oh, I, I think that I and maybe probably most people in the field feel that they're going to have a dramatic impact, uh, particularly uh, the anti-CD38 antibodies. Uh, where we're seeing direct tumor response caused by them alone and really remarkable results when they're combined with uh, other drugs that we use. Uh, I think it's very likely that they will be used throughout the course, as Peter's hopefully going to demonstrate, and will make a substantial difference in the outcome for patients, no question. One of the other new drugs is exazimib, an oral proteasome inhibitor, Peter. Is it your sense that uh, the proteasome inhibitors influence the genomics of the myeloma and perhaps as people progress later in the course of disease, the use of proteasome inhibitors may be less appropriate than perhaps the use of monoclonal antibodies? Oh, this is a very uh, daring question. Uh, I don't have the, uh, the direct answer to that. But what we have seen, both with carfilzomib and exazomib, is that in the relapse refractory setting, they are active uh, across the different cytogenetic risk group. Both high-risk and standard-risk patients benefit. And also in dedicated sub-analysis, this is confirmed. So my idea is that there's certainly a place for uh, proteasome inhibitors in the relapse setting. Uh, they will be active, as has been shown in the ASPIRE trial and the tourmaline trial. Uh, and exazomib has the advantage of being an oral treatment, which is very attractive for, uh, let's say, the older patient group. Surely, surely. Moving to the issue of the microenvironment and the genomics of the microenvironment, there was a little bit of a discussion about selecting the myeloma cells, doing the whole bone marrow. What, what would you describe the major differences that you might uh, uh, acquire by doing genomic studies of the whole marrow as opposed to just the myeloma cells? Well, I, I can give you an example from our, we have a mouse model of myeloma, which is immunocompetent, so it has all the microenvironment, all of the tumor cells. And we can um, look in one mouse that will transplant a tumor line into, and that tumor will always establish uh, one kind of microenvironment, whereas another tumor will, can, you will transplant will be another. And in one case, the one is very immunosuppressive microenvironment. And that tumor, when we treat the mouse with different drugs, doesn't respond to any of them. Whereas the, the one that establishes a more immunocompetent microenvironment, evidence that the host is reacting to the tumor, is actually responsive uh, to several drugs, instead of including some drugs we use to modulate the immune system. So I think each tumor probably does that in humans, too, in patients. That each tumor will establish its own microenvironment, and characterizing that and changing it into a favorable way is an important area of research. And your thoughts on the microenvironment, Peter, and doing genomic studies of value? Well, I think we have been uh, focusing maybe too much on the tumor cells only. Uh, today I showed some data uh, with a staining assay for not only the tumor cells, but also surrounding cells. Currently this study is ongoing, so I can't tell about the results too much, but we definitely look at patients that are treated with lenalidomide. What will be the effects to the microenvironmental cells? And uh, so this also extends to the immune system uh, with T cells and K cells and so on. To sum up, I want to thank Dr. Peter Sonnefeld from Rotterdam, Dr. Leif Bergsegel from Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. We've been discussing some aspects of the application of genomic studies to multiple myeloma with particular emphasis 
on the many new medicines that are available to treat the disease and on the complexity of developing both clinical trials to test these medicines, but also important studies that depend upon the donation by patients of their bone marrow and blood samples. Thank you.